very excited for our guest today, Andrew Henderson. Uh, some of you might know him better as the Nomad Capitalist, or perhaps the CEO of Nomad Capitalist, a man with more passports than most and perhaps pays less tax, tax than most, uh, for all good reasons, I'm sure. And I'm thrilled to have you here, Andrew, because A, it's something that's fairly close to my heart. I have done the sort of tour I did. Monaco, I looked at the Caribbean, I, I live in, in, in Hong Kong uh, most of the year, um, and I've been watching your content for quite some time, so it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you, and, and we were saying you were in the south of France. We just talked not so long ago about Tina Turner, who gave up U.S. citizenship uh, before she passed away uh, to become Swiss, but when she was talking to Larry King back in the day, where does she live? Yeah. Home was Zurich back when that was, I think, more tax friendly, that was the 90s. Um, and she's like, I can't spend too much time in the south of France. And I kind of wondered, like, is that the, uh, hey, I got to make sure I don't get sucked into that uh, French tax net. But uh, anyway, it's good to be with you and uh, to talk about this. Absolutely. And I think I think it's, it's, a, it's a real thing, right? I mean, I went at the end of COVID, um, we moved to London for a bit. And then once I realized that after 90 days there, I'm going to get basically taxed in about 70% of my worldwide income. Uh, I thought, okay, we've got to run. Um, so I kind of really understand where the, the, the tax planning comes in a lot more than, than before. And I guess I'd love to go back a step for people who are maybe not super familiar with you and your work and your expertise. If you meet somebody for the first time and they say, Andrew, what do you do? What do you say to them? I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a little Larry David in that regard. I, you know, uh, I, but, uh, we have a YouTube channel and we have about 2,600 videos and I tell them to go and watch the YouTube channel. But if I had to give you one message, um, you know, go where you're treated best. Mm -hmm. Those are the five magic words. That's what I stand for. Um, you know, I'm pretty passionate about the idea of choice and we exercise choice in, where we go to eat and where we go on a holiday and so many things of our life. We often don't exercise choice in terms of where we live, where we pay taxes, where we fall in love. We just think, oh, that, that was written into the stars and uh, you can't rewrite the stars. And I push back on that. Um, you know, being born in the U.S., not so far from Canada. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, had you moved just a little bit, you'd be Canadian. And it kind of shows to me that this nationality is this sort of accident of birth. Uh, we should all get to choose where, not only where we're from and how we identify, but, but where we want to live. And I think that go where you're treated best means you should have choices. It does not mean that the choice has to be paying zero tax. I will tell you, um, once you make a certain amount of money, uh, there's no country on earth, in my opinion, that's worth 50%. There's just so many. I mean, we've helped clients move to 31 different tax-friendly countries. I hear there's another one popping up in Europe that could be number 32. Uh, you know, that's about 20% almost of the world's sovereign countries. You can find one of, you can find one in five that you like uh, to avoid paying 50%, whether you want to pay zero, whether you want to pay one, two, five, ten, 10, whatever. Uh, go where you're treated best is about choice. And I think when you explain it that way, uh, a lot of people understand it. Mm -hmm. And I, no, I, I, I love that message because I think for me, the whole thing is getting people out of their rat race and their, their you know, the jobs and everything like that and kind of helping people do that transition because that's, that's what I did in my life. But you are right. The thing that most people just take for granted is where they happen to be living, where they happen to be born. And therefore, that's where they get a job. And that's where they marry someone who's from there. And that's where they pay tax. And I think it's something that most people never really thought of, particularly I find Americans. And I know you were born American. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you say to an American who's sort of brought up on the, the diet of it's the greatest country in the world? And you say to them, well, maybe it isn't. And maybe you should give up your citizenship. Like, how, how does that work in, in, in practical terms? Well, I, I gave up U.S. citizenship. I don't think the reason was taxation. I mean, Americans who are entrepreneurs, I mean, it's harder if you're in crypto or if you're a trader. But if you're an entrepreneur, you can move overseas and you can pay anywhere from zero to probably, you know, 10 percent by the time all is said and done. And if you want that optionality of always being able to be American um, because you want to go back at some point because you like the passport, you like the country or because you can't get an equal quality passport affordably, 
then by all means, maybe it's worth 10%. I think it's pretty diabolical. They get to be effectively the only country that taxes you for living somewhere else um, and kind of shame you, which is really, for me, the reason why I wanted to live. But most of the clients don't give up citizenship. They just choose to go to live overseas. They get a second passport. They prepare for things to get worse. And so I think, again, um, last year or last month, uh, record month, fewer than 20% of the clients were American. I think there was probably a time when 70% of them were. And so we're seeing a time when everyone realizes they need a backup plan or an active plan to change. I don't know that you have to convince anyone, but if I was talking to someone at a pub, I would say, listen, it's the greatest marketing job in history. I don't have a can of Coca-Cola here, um, but I drink Coca-Cola or Coke Zero because um, I guess, you know, I've, I'm like many people I've been advertised to for almost 40 years of my life that that red, I see that like, oh, yeah, well, that, that's refreshment. Why don't I drink RC Cola? Why don't I drink many other things? Um, well, they did one of the best marketing jobs in history. And I think that's what the United States and probably most other legacy brand countries. I mean, the U.S. being the biggest marketing job, but the U.K. to some extent, it's marketing. Um, I looked at, I was spending some time in places like Georgia, the country back in, I don't know, during the pandemic, I guess. And like right before that, and I got, you know, there were, there was, there's frustrations living anywhere. And I said, okay, let's have some kind of Western European base. And I looked at places like Italy where they've got a flat tax. And I said, I'm sure some people love Italy, but for me, having, knowing that I can live in Georgia, Italy is just Georgia with better marketing (laughs) for the things that matter to me. I think the wine in Georgia is good. The food in Georgia is good. I don't know the whole, you know, like you're not going to hang out at the Palazzo every day. You're not going to hang out at the Duomo every day, Like you're going to live a normal life. And so like the pace of how people do things, the government efficiency, all that, some of that's worse than Georgia. Hmm. Why does Italy have so many more people going there? It's marketing. And I think what we're seeing is the veneer is starting to crack as people are having a harder and harder time making it in these countries. And people like me and many others are talking about the Malaysias, for example. We're having our big event there again every year. We do it. Um, People come to Malaysia and they say, this is fantastic. It's better than some places in the U.S. So Malaysia had terrible marketing. Still does. Still does pretty much, yeah. (laughs) It's a lovely place. Amazing people people and all that. But yeah, it's it's got pretty bad marketing, I think. So I, I would say, listen, I mean, you know, how many places have you lived? And what is it you're really looking for? And if you think that there's no other place in the world with California weather or California girls or whatever it is that you're looking for, there's there's something everywhere. Um, but increasingly, perhaps as I built a business that works with people from all over the world, or perhaps as I just get a little older and wiser, and you know, I I, I want to change people's minds less. Okay. Um, you know, if you're the average middle class person, I mean, life in the legacy brain countries is getting tough. You should Absolutely. find a way to get a remote job, start a business online, live from wherever you want, cut your costs, cut your tax bill. That's how you will thrive. That's not the clientele I talk to. Um, so, you know, if you just make 120 grand living in the U.S., maybe you should stay living in the U.S. If, if you're required to live in the U.S. to make the 120 grand. But if you want to make a lot of money and if you want freedom and if you want adventure and if you want to see the world develop in front of your eyes, um, then why would you stay in a country where none of those things are, are possible? I, I very much agree. I think I, I, I like that you're sort of saying you're not trying to convert people. You're kind of waiting for them to sort of let the penny drop and then, and then come to you and ask you for advice once they have that, uh, that issue of where do, where do we go? Um, when I, I'm a very methodical person. I'm, I'm German by birth. So I sort of can't help the spreadsheet approach to life. Um, yeah. when I thought about moving or at least having a second base, I literally made a spreadsheet. Um, of pretty much yeah. every country in the world. And my list was this availability of staff, service staff. I value that a lot. Yeah. Um, tax, safety. Can I own property? And then just sort of general lifestyle. Like, is there something within a vicinity? Is there something you would say I, I missed from that list? Is there something else that you look for when you, when you assess countries? One of the things I've optimized for in recent years is kindness. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm an intense person. Uh, I can be brusque at times, but I think that for me, kindness is a value. Much more important than nice, by the way. I mean, nice is fleeting. Even politeness is fleeting. Kindness matters. That's one thing I think Malaysia does very well in. Places like Colombia, I think, to a certain extent, do well there. Um, Genuinely kind. Georgia, I mean, probably the easiest place I've lived to make friends. 
Um, so that matters. And people talk about, you know, what's going to happen when society falls apart. And that's where they think the U.S. is the place. I don't know that a bunch of people who've had it too good for too long are going to be the people to support you. Um, yeah, consumer conveniences on top of that. Um, you know, for me, availability to travel, that's oh. not that important to everybody. But, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to live in Costa Rica five hours from the nearest airport. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I went to the so, Bahamas and I looked at, um, what is that place? There's a beautiful little island. Um, it's got Paradise Beach. There. I mean, you know, that, that, that pink beach. It's where all the Americans go for like 100K weeks uh, on the hot trips. And, and I thought it was amazing. I got there and I thought, this is a flight away from an airport that is two hours away from Miami. And I was just like, I don't think I can do that. You know, it's just, it's just too remote. You're not going to be able to really enjoy the world if you are stuck somewhere like that. I, I, I realize that this is maybe the, this is why I don't try and convince people as much. I mean, I try and tell people, Hey, uh, you know, if you're from the U S your passport's the 44th best, that's our, our own 44. passport index, but actual facts pass. Yeah. Pa you're, you know, in some parts of the U.S., the infant mortality rate is worse than Sudan. I mean, hey, I, just look at all those kinds of statistics. I mean, if that doesn't convince you, then, you know, maybe you don't want to be convinced. But I will say this. Some people want to live in the pristine beach. I am more of a city person. I like the energy that comes from that. I, I'm not looking to retire. Um, but there's something for everybody. That's, that's my approach. I'm not one of these guys who sets up in Dubai and everybody needs a Dubai company and a Dubai residence. Somebody does. They're probably being misled because they do have tax now on companies in Dubai. Nine percent, right? Percent. Uh, you know, everybody's coming out. Oh, he's misleading. Yeah, it's not. It's nine percent. Just you know, admit it, guys. You have one country to offer people. I know you're angry that, that you're zero percent tax, and you've got to you've got to trip over yourself trying to explain the nine percent tax. But it's fine. I I have thirty one, thirty two countries that people can go to. So I, I I think you have to come to an acceptance that everyone's a little bit different. Um, but I would also add. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you just, you want to have kind of the availability of services. I think staff increasingly, yes, I'm with you on that one. Uh, there's a couple of things that I could, I could add in there, but, but you know, um, you don't want to be too isolated. I would also add, you want something that's different from where you're from. One of the mm -hmm. things that Americans, Brits, et cetera, oh yeah, I tried this thing. I moved to, uh, you know, I moved to, uh, uh, you know, Canada or something, That's too or, you know, I, I know someone who's a friend. I, I, I've talked to this, this, this colleague of mine, her friend has lived in Vancouver, uh, Dublin, London, and now Amsterdam. I said, they lived in the same place. There's the, it's the same place in the scope of the world's the same. Hmm. And then eventually they say, Oh, you know, these, 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 you know, places where there's no freedom. It's like, yeah, cause you didn't go somewhere different. Um, that's something I, I really, I, I said recently, I've got an African passport. I know Africa is not a country, but it's a passport okay. of an African country. Which one? Um, in the Comoros. Okay. Uh, I don't, I can't say I use it very much, but it's like, okay, keep that in your back pocket for the next 20 years. Who knows what develops there? And if you, you know, I look at three categories, finance, freedom, and lifestyle. Right. If you want the best lifestyle, you're probably not moving to the Comoros or most places in Africa, but if you want freedom in the future, mm -hmm. Look at all the developments there in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think it might be a place that you have freedom. And if you want finances, well, maybe that's a place to invest or Asia or something. And, you know, where do you go to reduce your taxes? But which ones are more important for you? Um, I've, you know, I've never optimized for, you know, when I was single, I never optimized for the dating lifestyle. I went places that I wanted to go. Some guys do optimize for dating. So Kuala Lumpur becomes Bangkok because it's far superior for dating. Um, I didn't do that. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that you think about. Um, and it's different based on whether you need to be dating or not, or whether you need health care or not, or what your priorities are. Mm. Let's, say, let's make this a bit more practical. Let's say I'm an American. I've got a decent job that allows me to work remotely. And I'm just thinking, I want to sort of take the baby steps of where do I go? Is there like a passport I should get first? Is there somewhere that I should go first? Is there sort of a process for someone who's, who's curious about how can I pay less tax? Where do my, my, my dollars maybe go further? And where can I get a bit more sunshine? You want to convince yourself and you want to build the foundation for making this long term. People talk about the difference between expats and immigrants and mm -hmm. people get upset because they think, oh, expat is for white people. Like, you know, you or I, we live in yeah. Hong Kong, whatever. Here's what expat is for me. 
it's impermanent. Yes, I agree. And I've been in Malaysia. Um, it's been my, my longest base. And I see a lot of people come and go. You see the Danish family, they come for three years. They know they're going to go. And what happens? Oh, we're going to have, we're going to go back and get married and have a kid. We can't live here anymore. There's no kids in Malaysia. No schooling. Like, yeah. It's, it's, there's no schools. It's like, okay. I'm like, by the way, if the objection is actually like, well, we want to be around our parents, mm -hmm. well, maybe, maybe if your parents are retired, maybe they should come here maybe, yeah. and live a lot better life. But okay. Like let's get to the real objection, but they never intended to integrate into mm -hmm. society. They never planned to be citizens. They never planned to learn the language. Like that's an expat. An immigrant is you're working towards citizenship. So you want, if you want to avoid that, because I, we've had clients that, you know, three years later, they're like, eh, you know what, this isn't for me. And it's usually the children of immigrants, by the way, where they get like shamed into, we worked so hard to come to this country and now you're leaving. Okay, you leave, okay. But you want to convince yourself, like open a bank account somewhere like a Georgia, like an Ecuador, like anywhere they, you know, you can put in a hundred bucks and go and just keep looking and see that the money's still there. Do stuff like that. Right. Do small things that are like, oh my God, I have money here and I have money there and it's kind of the same. And actually this one works kind of better. Um, so do that. Okay. If you have an ancestor in your family tree, I'm not talking about the 1600s. I'm talking parent, grandparent, maybe great grandparent, maybe one more generation than okay. that in a few countries. Claim your citizenship by descent. Might take a years, but they're generally pretty good passports. Often in Europe, we've also helped people who had like St. Kitts and Nevis. We had a guy who was Panamanian. We had Mexican. We had um, one in South America. I forget which one. Um, Claim passports from your ancestry. That could include your mother was born in Canada. If you're born in Canada, you're Canadian. So you can claim that generally. Um, if not, you know, I think everyone needs a second passport. There's ways to do it by investment. If you're an entrepreneur, there's ways to do it. Cyprus just opened a program. If you are that kind of talented professional, they're going to fast track you in three years. Um, so there's all kinds of opportunities. Um, I think bank account, citizenship, a residence permit. If you're American, I like something like Mexico. It's easy to get to or even right next door. Mm -hmm. um, most Latin American residence permits are based on just having income. So you don't really have to invest most, and it's, much. It's, if anything, it's most a couple of, those of thousand countries. dollars a month or something. I mean, in some of the South American countries, it goes down to like 900 bucks. Okay, wow. Well. Um, plus for dependents. So yeah, I think the highest might be 4,000 a month. So what would, would be the advantage um, that you, you can go there and you can spend some time there, um, your dollars will go further. Are you saving tax? Not really, right? Because you're still an American citizen at that point. State taxes. Well, if we're talking to Americans, well, you're right. I mean, state tax, if you're, let's say you live in a state with state tax, I mean, I'm not giving tax advice yeah. here, but you know, perhaps you might want to move to a state without state tax, get settled in there just for the, the basic requirements and then leave because a state like California is still going to be difficult. Even if you go overseas, there's about four or five of them that are kind of nasty. Of course, California is one. Uh, no, what, what you're doing is if you're not willing to take the plunge right away, yeah, you're not going to save tax. So for most people, as you mentioned, I mean, depending on your ties, the UK, maybe you've got to be gone eight, nine, 10 months a year. Mm. Uh, other Western countries, you know, six months uh, in the country, you're certainly screwed. Yes. But it's not like six months out and you're not screwed. So it's probably, you're looking at being gone eight, nine, 10 months a year. If you're an American, there's a bit more flexibility where if you're gone like 11 months a year, give or take, it's even easier. So there's ways from nine to like 11 months for Americans. But that's the amount of time that you're planning to spend out. Everything else that you're doing that's less than that is I want, again, the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Hey, go and enjoy more affordable, more this, more that, more whatever, somewhere else. Spend your summers, spend your winters. Um, you're diversifying your assets. You're protecting some assets. You don't have all your eggs in one basket anymore. Uh, and you're preparing for something bad happening. Um, it could be a pandemic. It could be a big tax hike. It could be whatever. The person who has the home, the residence permit, the passport somewhere else, when the taxes go up, the pandemic locks things down, whatever, is going to be more prepared and more comfortable to leave. People say, I'll leave when things get bad enough. Well, not if you don't know what you're going to do. Like, you're just going to keep sitting around and saying, well, that's not quite bad enough. Things have been getting pretty darn bad this century yeah. in the Western world. I mean, like, they're spying on you. Like, you've known that for over a decade. How much, like, you know, more do you have to know? So if things got bad enough, you would have been gone by now. So having these things set up, 
makes it easier to leave when something bad happens when you want more or you'll realize there's more freedom or you'll realize the girls are nicer or whatever and uh, yeah once you're comfortable spending those nine ten eleven months out of the country you already know what your plan is and it's been vetted and then you can lower your taxes dramatically if you're an american maybe substantially if you're anyone else to zero sure sure okay so what's the um I imagine another objectionist, and I'm sort of tr trying to, you know, treating you as a, as an objection killer here. Um, for me, one one thing was the big big deal was pets. So I've got golden retriever, I've got three cats. Traveling with pets was significantly harder during the pandemic than it, it normally was, and it, it ruled out, for example, places like Malaysia. I would have gone to because they just had, you know, um, idiotic systems. Children, I imagine, would be the other one. I haven't got any yet. Um, is that something you guys help with? Do you sort of, when people say, hey, I want to spend nine months in Colombia or something, I mean, presumably they have good international schools in Colombia, but is that, is that something that's sort of a solvable thing? Is that a big criteria for people? Well, Colombia is a place that has a non-Western tax system where it largely is a day's test. So if you're there for those six months, uh, you will be taxed. The tax rates are not the best. Okay. They're some of the lowest among the OECD countries, uh, but they're not the best globally. So you would like to, if, you know, I have a home in Colombia. I was just there a couple months ago. That's a place you want to keep under six months generally okay. to not get into their system. If nothing else, just to avoid the paperwork. My good, I mean, I'm not opposed to paying something reasonable, but just the paperwork is Byzantine. So, uh, yeah, I, I've been doing this for a long time. I started researching this global citizenship stuff back in like 06 mm -hmm. uh, with a focus on frontier markets. I thought that was the future. Cambodia was one of the big ones I was interested in, still am. And so, you know, I've, I've taken the slings and arrows myself of doing this. I am still going through and closing bank accounts and moving some stocks over. And just, you know, I move really quickly and I adjust as I go. And so I think that my approach and our company's approach is a human approach um where it's a holistic approach if you have kids okay what's going to serve your kids yeah i mean it may not be cambodia it may not be colombia but i believe you can and joshua sheets who's speaking at our event nomad capitalist live he has a podcast he has five kids uh they homeschool them and they follow my trifecta method he basically spends four months a year in three different countries and i saw him in colombia a couple months ago i think the guy stayed in a bloody hotel um, I think it gets a couple of hotel rooms for the family. Um, so you could do anything from that. You could rent a mansion. You could buy homes in three countries, and that could get you the residence permit or citizenship in some of them um, to allow you to live there that amount of time, to, to put you on a track to citizenship. I mean, so many things overlap. But, yeah, I mean, kids to me are doable. Now, homeschooling is maybe the easier way if you're bouncing around. But, yes, you could spend nine months in a place, put your kids in an international school, uh, and then go and live somewhere else in the summer. I mean, there's so many different permutations. We talk to people about that. Mm. Um, yes. And on pets, uh, yeah, m for me, the pets, I, I go and get like, especially in Malaysia, uh, I'll just find a cat that has a problem and I'll take the cat in and I'm there for three or four months. I get the cat cleaned up. I find the cat. I've probably done that, you know, dozen or 15 times. And that, that serves my nomad pet needs, where I have the cat for a while when it's nice and small and cute, and then I you know, find someone. And I just actually got a video the other day of uh, some Malaysian family propagandizing my old cat with, with the prime minister's speech. They're listening, the cat's on the, on the stove listening to the prime minister. Um, mm -hmm. And here's the cat a year later. Um, yeah, I mean, there are places that are pet friendly. I think certainly flying private you know, makes it a little bit easier mm -hmm. if you have larger breeds. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think we have a back end system. We track all this. I don't know off the top of my head what those places are, but I certainly know people do it. By the way, uh, what somebody said they did for pets was they do my trifecta system, four months in each place. It's lifestyle friendly for adventure and for low tax, but they do it in one region. So they were like Mexico, Colombia, and I forget where else. So it's a, sh it's, it's a shorter distance. Um, so if you speak Spanish, like mm -hmm. that could work. Rather than me, like Malaysia, <laughs> Colombia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, I mean, it gets to be yeah. Long. The, that the, would be the long distance that. is a is a bit of a harder thing, and even with the with private, you still got to stop somewhere typically, and it's kind of yeah, it, it makes the thing a little bit less um, fun. <laughs> I think it's a little bit. So what we do now, we leave the pets in Hong Kong when we travel, uh, and they're looked after by the people they know and love, and then we we know we're a bit more free when we roam around. But um, you mentioned your trifecta. To your so, point. Um, 
real quick to your point on the thing, I, we recently were looking at a model where you have a house manager for someone who wants that nine months in one mm. place, get a house manager. Uh, and perhaps while you're gone and some people can't handle this maybe, but uh, have the house manager stay, do all the dirty work while you're gone, the chimney sweeping and the roof repairs and all that. And, and they can, you know, watch the pets. I know people maybe like to not be three months away from their pets, but that was something that also came up recently. Sure, sure, sure. And that's basically what we do. We've got, we've got, you know, lovely, um, housekeepers who live with us and, and, and they, they look after them, um, which is probably much better than putting them through boxes and airports and, you know, all that kind of stuff, which pets then usually, are usually a big, my, my, my dog gets off the plane and he's like, where the heck are we? <laughs> he's just confused because it doesn't really make sense to them, right? It's kind of hard to explain. But you mentioned your trifecta system a couple of times. I'd love to touch upon that a little bit. Like, what does that look like? And how does somebody start to implement that? Like, what are the things that they should look at? What should they be kind of like thinking about in terms of criteria? Can it, I, it keeps freezing. I hate to, I like to do this live to air, but can you repeat the question? Because it keeps coming out. I'm not sure if it's you or me. Sure. Um, your trifecta system. How does somebody start to implement that? What does that look like? What are the kind of criteria they need to be, be aware of to make those decisions? Yeah, so trifecta, and by the way, there's different versions. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm not as, I appreciate the Germanic nature. I use Germanic approaches to renovations and things like that. But when it comes to where I want to live, I find it very hard to find three places that I want to spend exactly the same amount of time. So I, call, I created the modified trifecta where maybe you want to spend six months in a place that's tax friendly in order to be a tax resident and then keep yourself out of other tax nets, or you just like the lifestyle. But let's just call it a perfect trifecta. Three places, four months each, could be in the same region, could be all over the world. I mean, you want to find three places that you like. Can you swap them out over time? Sure. And to me, that's the beauty of it is you're going all in, but one third the commitment. And if you want to raise the commitment to one in the future, you can, but it's reducing that desire to want to go home because you know, you're in Kuala Lumpur. You spent just, that's my example. You spend four months there and maybe something irritates you about it. Maybe the weather's too hot, maybe whatever. Well, after four months, you're on to the next place. And so every time you come back, it's like, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and you enjoy the best parts of it. I go to Bogota for two weeks. I love watching people on their bikes. They're cycling. People are dancing in the streets. They're shaking their behinds. Uh, you know, you have the amazing coffee culture there. This is a great vibe. I have friends there. Um, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I feel a little detached. Um, you know, I enjoy it for what it is. I do some business. I meet our people in that region. And I move on. Mm. So you want to find three places. Uh, maybe it's best to start with one place and then build from there. What I did for many years, uh, well, what I did at the beginning, let's say, I found the place that I liked the most because my focus was Asia. Uh, I said, I could live in Hong Kong. I don't see the need to spend the money. I don't need to have a job in Hong Kong. So I said, all right, 12 years ago, I'll be cheap. I'll go to Kuala Lumpur. I like that as equally as much. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, you know, rented a place full time, eventually bought a place. Um, and I would travel from there. And so it was kind of like a five, six month base, but I was constantly looking for the other places. And as I connected with where do I feel good, I added places to the list. But you have to be open minded that it may not be the places that you think. I mean, it's probably not the Bahamas, Italy, and, uh, you know, what's, what's something else people like. It, it nice. may be places that are <laughs> off the wall. I got off the taxi in Bangkok, and I just, from the first minute of the full month I was in Thailand, I just felt like, ah. Yeah, I have the same feeling um, about Bangkok. I love it. Couple of days, I'm happy to see some friends, but I, I don't really, I don't know, I don't really want to spend a lot, lot of time there. I don't know, I don't know what that is. It's I will say they have great dining. I and that's for a what friend's you say. It's a, they have some top notch. It's a personal thing, right? It's a personal yeah. decision. Yeah, you, right. So I, 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 yeah, I can't tell you where to go. Our event is in uh, Nomad Capitalist Live is in Kuala Lumpur again because I want people to come. Mm. Maybe somebody will leave and say, "Hey, I'm glad I came. Beautiful hotel, great event. The city's not for me." But at least it's functional. And if nothing else, at least you will see, oh, my goodness, like the roads are amazing, better than in many parts of the U.S. Like all the things. All right. Maybe you don't like it, but at least you'll take something away from that. Yeah. The Malaysia is a lovely place. Like I've been going there for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Amazing people, super friendly, amazing food. If you love the tropical vibe, it's brilliant, I think. And KL is a nice city. I mean, it's not 
I wouldn't say it's quite Hong Kong, but it's, it's a lovely city. I mean, it's very, no. very livable. I lived in the U.S. when I was an adult for about a decade uh, in a city, Phoenix, Arizona. And that's like a nice place to live. Anytime someone said they're visiting Phoenix, I'm like, why? Why would you like, what's there to do? And I think I've probably chosen cities like that over the years where, yeah, I mean, if you're going to visit KL, three, four, five days, depending on pace, move on. There's other things to see. Um, but if you want a place just to be and to get things done and to get work done and to be able to speak English, uh, it's a great place to hang out. It's incredibly affordable, which isn't maybe the only criteria that should matter. But I don't know. You kind of you have to kind of, uh, you know, marvel at like getting a giant bowl of delicious food for two bucks. I, I never get tired of that. Yeah. No matter what, even if I'm having caviar for dinner, I love having the two-dollar lunch. <laughs> and the food's incredible. I mean, people haven't experienced it. Like, go, guys, go, go, and uh, have some amazing yeah. food in, 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 in KL and see the islands and see Singapore and I don't know, maybe Indonesia or whatever yeah. al alongside. So a lot of this seems to be about lifestyle and experiences rather than just pure tax planning. I think that's kind of I think maybe the perception people just look at, but it'll save money, money in terms of tax. But it seems from what you're saying more about actually how do i enjoy my life how do i get to see the world yeah people say oh uh this is more of the freedom piece oh if you're always going to be running from something you know you'll never you'll never survive very american thing to say mm -hmm. um there's always somewhere coming up uh, again the uk just ended its non-dom tax program yeah um and now we see another country in europe it's gonna be popping up with a with a new lump sum tax when one door closes one opens you may not like the new one opening but you know there will always be opportunities and in the same way i say to myself i'm not i'm running to something i wanted to see uh the world evolving i think the u.s is heading in the wrong direction momentum is going in the wrong direction i think socially you're headed towards i mean some kind of you know uh, muted civil war um there's just a lot of problems in the legacy brand countries mm -hmm. and i said let me go see what's developing let me go see where people's wages are rising rather than being stagnant or falling let me go see where things like people are, are optimistic i want to see that with my own very eyes uh sure it didn't hurt that as a young entrepreneur in the west you know back before entrepreneurship was cool a lot more german and chinese girls were interested in entrepreneurs at 25 years old than, than there were in the u.s and that didn't hurt but yeah, I think it's about adventure. I think it's about lifestyle. I think it's about saying there must be something even cooler than this out there. And guess what? If there's not, give it three years. And the, you know, we're all going to live to like 100. Yeah. At uh, least. My grandmother just turned 90. My grandmother's turning 94. Like she's born in 19, uh, tw no, she's turning 95. She's born in 1929. If she'll live to 100, we can all live to 100. I agree with you. And it's 3% of your life. Like, do it, mm. save some taxes. I think three years is kind of the minimum in a lot of countries to save taxes and go back. Like, yes, the taxes are nice because the, you'll find you think you're paying for everything to work well. And then you go to plenty of places where there's no tax or 1% tax and they work just as well. And you say, I've been, I've been, just, I've been scammed. And that's the point. Sorry, and it was just a little bit laggy there, but it, it, it does come through <laughs> in the end. Um, but no, I, 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 I completely agree with you. And I think if we can encourage people who are watching this to do the one little easy step that you mentioned at the beginning, go somewhere that is in your country, open a bank account, um, go there for a couple of weeks a year or something, and just get your feet wet and start to see the world and start to see that there's a world outside the box that you were born into and the sort of mindset limitations that we have, I think, I think the, it's fantastic. And along the way, make some money and figure out how to save some taxes, which means it's twice as wonderful. And um, I really love that. I really like, like your input there. If I can leave you with two quick questions. One, I'd love to see, is there one place that you say is on the rise? And two, tell us about your event in November. What's going on there in KL? Well, I think a lot of places are on the rise and some places are on the rise for some period of time and you take your profits, whether that's literally in terms of you invest there and you cash out or figuratively in terms of you live there for 10 years or you have a second home or whatever, and then it no longer works for you and you move on. I mean, I think that 
that's the big lesson. People say, oh, well, what are you going to, where are you going to go if the next place doesn't work out? And one of the speakers at our event, his parents moved from Sri Lanka to Australia and he moved from Australia to Dubai. So each generation goes to the next great place. Uh, and I think there's something to that. If we're going to romanticize ancestors, at least where I'm from in the U.S., and they did the right thing by moving to the U.S., well, maybe each generation does the, the right thing by moving somewhere else. And, uh, you know, for me, if you had children and each of them lived in different places because they each went to what was the best place for them, maybe one's going to be an AI. There's going to be a place that's going to say, we want to be the capital of AI. There's going to be a place that's going to want, where we want to be the capital of crypto. You're going to see many more niche players. There's not going to be one Singapore or one South Korea. So, you know, for crypto, it could be Bermuda, it could be Malta, it could be any number of places. What I know is it won't be the United States because they're threatened and they keep pushing back on it. And look at how many people they're charging with crimes uh, relating to crypto and AML and all that. Some of them, I'm sure, are guilty and ran scams and did bad things. I don't support that. I'm guessing some of them just didn't collect enough information on their customers and it upsets the U.S. government. So that's not going to be a place to want to go. Um, I think from a lifestyle perspective, I mean, a place like Malaysia is fantastic. I think from an investment perspective, a place like Cambodia remains on my radar. Nepal is coming up. Bangladesh is coming up. I follow the global citizen sandwich. Assets are on the top part of the sandwich. If you're in Asia, that's Singapore. I think Singapore is the best transa transactional banking hub in the world, mm -hmm. better than Switzerland. So Singapore is the top part. That's where you store all your wealth. The bottom part of the sandwich is where you invest the wealth in places that are up and coming, like a Bangladesh or a Cambodia. Uh, I think Asia is probably as good a place as any for opportunity. And then you live somewhere in the middle. It doesn't have to be in Asia. If it is, I think Malaysia is right in the middle, maybe Bangkok. Um, you know, if it's somewhere else, okay, what's in the middle? Um, you know, there's a number of places. So I want you to have that diversification uh, to where you're not, you're not having all your eggs in one basket. I own property in Malaysia. I do not think it will go up in value in the next five years. Mm -hmm. I own it so I have control over my space. I have an aesthetic environment I can work in and I feel totally comfortable. Yeah. I can go there whenever I want. It's waiting for me. I do not buy it as a financial investment. Over time, I think it'll do fine. I don't plan on selling it ever. So what do I care if it goes up a little bit? Some, most other properties I, I do have, I have. But like diversify your finances, your freedom and your lifestyle and look at the global citizen sandwich to where each place does different things for you. Now, the event is in Kuala Lumpur because I didn't want to be, not only can I not go, I would have to ask for a visa if I wanted to go back to the United States. I don't <laughs> want to do that. And so some of my employees would too, and they probably also wouldn't get one. Um, so, you know, I don't want to have an event that teaches people how to do this stuff in Orlando or Austin. Um, I just think people should come out and experience it. So it's a four day event. Uh, we've got the president or the CEO of AirAsia, which is like the biggest airline in Asia. You've been there. I mean, it's like they've revolutionized travel. Mm -hmm. It's the Ryanair of Asia, but like it's a good airline, actually. Uh, he's speaking. Yeah. Uh, Nigel yeah. Farage, who, whether you like Brexit or not, he was on bank. I do, actually. <laughs> and that speaks volumes about what they're doing to you in the West, in Canada, yeah. in the UK. They don't like it. They shut you down. Yeah, crazy. Um, we've got emerging markets experts. We've got. Uh, our own team talking about the latest tax incentives. This stuff changes every month. Passports, tax incentives. Uh, we have people coming to talk about investing in Southeast Asia. I mean, just go to nomadcapitalist.com slash live. We sold out the general admission tickets for 2024. Um, we have a few VIP, uh, VIP spots. But, I mean, it's basically a lot of commentators on where the world's going economically, both from a Western and Eastern perspective. Where can you go and be free? Where can you go and invest your money? Where can you go and protect your money? Uh, with some big names in there. Bitcoin as well is going to be covered. But it's an event. It's not a conference. It's not a trade show. There's no sponsors. Um, it's a premium ticket because there's no sponsors. And we just overload your mind for four days with some great Malaysian food, drinks, cocktail yeah. parties. We've got uh, uh, a nightclub this year for the first time ever at the event. It's an event where you meet amazing people from 35 different countries. Um, you talk to people about like Venezuela. There's a place that I think has some potential. We have two people who work for us in Venezuela. Interesting. And they're successful people. They go to the U.S., they go to Europe, they travel all over the world, um, but they can buy stuff in their country and it's incredibly cheap right now. Yeah. What's, the, what's the story? Don't watch CNN or the BBC. Come and talk to them 
while you're mingling during lunch and hear like, what's the opportunity to buy an apartment for 10 grand? Yeah, what's that's the, the kind of stuff you what's get. What's the risk there? Meet some people, you might help facilitate that in some way and stuff. Okay, that's very cool. Um, that sounds very interesting. Um, absolutely. So, Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure to get a bit of an insight into your mind and into your knowledge. Appreciate you sharing it. And I think really, like, I'm always all about getting people towards the financial freedom goal, but also life freedom. And this really takes it yeah. to the next level, which is actually the world's your oyster. And that's how I live my life. I spend it between usually Hong Kong and South of France here in London, um, where I have friends and enjoy being here. But would I want to be here all the time? No. Yeah. And it gives you that, as you say, you meet people, you get different impressions, um, and it will probably change. I might not be in this spot in 10 years, right? But for, for, for the moment, I'm here for a little, for a little while each year. And Every time I come, I'm excited. And then every time I leave, I'm excited to go to the next place. And I think yeah. we seem to be sharing that, that sort of way of, 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 of living life. And it's, it's, I like what you said. People always say, I'm running away from things. And you're not. It's not really about running away from tax. It's just getting that set up in a way that's advantageous to you because you can take advantage of it. And if you don't, it's kind of, it's, it's a real missed opportunity, right? That's actually you know, wh why do people go to work, right? Not because they love it usually, but because they need to make some money. So they're making their life well, we do, two but, or three times as hard. You know, it, yeah, but most people don't. Most I, people I, have, a, have a job. They drive to it and they sit in traffic and they sit in a cubicle, right? I mean, okay, this isn't exactly work, right? We get to have a nice, interesting chat about some, some fun stuff. So this is a bit different to what the 99% experience. I, I was watching a, uh, a basketball player uh, talk about how he doesn't leave his house if he's not in a good mood. Because if people come up to him, he wants to be in a good mood. I'd say if people come up to me, I'm in a good mood 97% of the time. Uh, when they corner you, I don't know if this has happened to you, like when they corner you in a stairwell and like, like, like not so much in a good mood. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are commenting, oh yeah, like that's what famous people should do. And I'm not saying like that I'm as famous as this basketball player by any means. But that's what it should be. Like, that's your obligation to society if you're famous. Like, some people didn't choose to be famous. There's something happened. They got the spotlight. And so that kind of showed me just how out of touch the average person is from people who've chosen to be successful, who are self-made yeah. people. And so in the same way, if you make $80,000, I think life in the U.S. has gotten worse and it will continue to get yeah. worse. And Tough. again, if you can make that $80,000 and your company will let you live anywhere else in the world, you cut the tax bill, potentially, you cut the cost of living, that's gonna be the difference. Like the taxes, water seeks its own level. The taxes are what makes places unaffordable. If you cut the taxes out, it'd be delightful. But still, maybe 80 grand, you're in the black bracket where you should keep your US citizenship, maybe you wanna stay there, it's a good place to get a job. I think it's all changing, but still. But also understand, if you make $10 million a year, yeah, suddenly the guy who makes 80 grand and pays 10 grand in taxes and, and probably says he pays his taxes, you're not paying 5 million. <laughs> and if you were paying 5 million, you'd probably be like, this is a hell of a lot more than I should be paying. Yeah. Which is why a non-DOM system like what the UK just abolished makes so much sense. Uh, Pay taxes on the money that you live on. If you make 10 million in Ireland as a non-DOM or Malta or Cyprus, but you only bring in 300,000 to live on, you pay the ridiculous tax rate on 300,000. Yeah. That sounds like a lot more fair system than you just were productive and we're gonna penalize you. And so, you know, yeah, to your point, people have a lot of opinions about something they've never experienced. Mm -hmm. I guarantee if you put that guy in a situation to make 10 million and he's paying yeah. 5 million in taxes, he's gonna start complaining. But it's easy to be making 80 grand and make fun of the guy that he can't imagine. Completely. And it's, and it becomes a, a reality, right? Like you look at your tax bill and, you know, Hong Kong's got a 16% tax is relatively fair, you might think. But when you get your tax bill, you're still thinking, okay, <laughs> it has a fair few zeros on it, right? So is that something I want to do something about? I think it just, unless you've walked in the shoes, um, you can't really judge it. So I think, um, and again, lump sum systems. I mean, the Italy, the hundred thousand, the yeah. Greece, hundred thousand, the new one coming on 50,000. I'm happy. I, I'm happy to live in any country and say I pay more in taxes than the average person. I think it's fair. Now that might be one percent tax rate for me on my global income because they don't include my foreign corporation. They don't do this, like, you know, whatever. 
I'm not opposed to that. And so if, if Italy says, hey, come in for 15 years, give us 100,000 euros and we don't care what you do. Make as much as you want or as little yeah. as you want. Uh, hey, you know what? I would not move to Italy and pay their regular taxes. So they're getting zero from me right now. But if mm. it's like, okay, I like Italy, 100,000, that, that's the price for the services that you get. And you don't get as many services as a, as a citizen. So you're paying more than most people to get less. Uh, and yet people don't come, you know, people still have complaints about that. That to me is all about jealousy. If you want to argue against not paying zero, again, you live, live in Malaysia, you might pay zero if it's all offshore. Mm. But, you know, if you make 10 million and you go to pay your 100,000, that to me is a jealousy issue. If someone has a complaint, because how many Italians pay 100,000 euros? <laughs> not many. Or how many Greeks not pay 50,000? Like almost, almost none. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, and people don't realize this, how many people in Greece even pay their yeah. taxes? I mean, you're starting to get in some of those Southern European countries where it's kind of like Eastern Europe mentality of like, they know their government's wasting the money. They're they're playing the games. That's not what you and I do. We have the fear of God put into us by our countries. Right. And I think that's fine. But uh, yeah, pay 100,000 euros, make as much as you want, pay, you know, 1%, 2%, enjoy yourself. And quite frankly, um, again, it's all competition. It is. And that's but a somehow good... this is the competition you're not supposed to like. Yeah, well, you can see why governments don't like it. <laughs> uh, the inefficient ones and the inept ones particularly. But yeah, I think the message here is make the world your oyster. Um, you can make choices beyond the choices that most people are making right now. And I think if you are uh, looking to do that, obviously reach out to, to Andrew and his team. And um, yeah, run through some of the easy baby steps, I think. I think that'll change people's lives. If you do, people do that, just go somewhere, open a bank account, spend a couple of weeks, a couple of months there and just sort of see how you like it, right? And you go to the next place and you move on and, and, and you just find something that suits you and, and, and your preferences. So um, brilliant, Andre. I'd really appreciate your time. I love what you're doing. Um, keep keep putting out all that information on YouTube. I think people you too. Get, a, get a tremendous amount of value from that. And um I'd be lovely to see you sometime in KL. Um, I'll be over there, I'm sure, sometime this year. And um, speak soon. God is going to be with you. I set out on a mission to find an industry and then companies and stocks that I could buy and hold forever.